so you're going to have to rely on zoom and and observational techniques that really use technology probably more than we would normally have preferred to do that um, but i think there are other things that that can help um, i'll give you an example of a, a really nice study one of my doctoral students did on he was interested he's a software designer and he was interested in note-taking software and uh, he decided to study how people used visual spatial techniques in their note taking. And there was a lot of research done on uh, note taking from lectures, but not much in terms of note taking from texts. So he had 16 um, participants in his study and he did a number of interviews with them based on looking at the notes that they had taken um, across a period of time. They chose the time and they scanned all the notes and sent them to him. And uh, then he did one-on-one -on -one interviews with them about those notes. Um, and out of that study came, came some really nice conclusions. For example, a, a concept of something called future self, that when note takers, experienced note takers are taking notes, they imagine what they're going to do with them afterwards. So the visual and spatial uh, uses were different if they were writing a paper or making a presentation from when they were taking a test. It was different whether they knew the material or the material was outside of their, their domain. And so that combination of talking with people and looking with art at artifacts that they make was, was especially powerful and it didn't depend on sitting in a room to do that. Um, he had a, you know, a lot of um, uh, upfront work to do to try to kind of sort through the language. He used a grounded theory approach and was very language driven in how they describe things. Um, but, but I think essentially when, it, when you got down to it, the, the remote technique was not a problem in understanding some, some of that material. I think that was very helpful. Um, also, I think there, um, we need to start looking at some of the interdisciplinary uh, implications of the kind of work that we're doing. And it's pretty hard to avoid that today. And uh, I'll re refer you to Julie Thompson Klein's work. She's done a number of books on this. And she talks about three kinds of interdisciplinarity that are happening. Um, one is this bridge building between two disciplines that remain pretty much intact. Um, that you don't see um, uh, serious erosion in the single discipline. They just start collaborating. Uh, and in some cases, you can see ethnography and graphic or ethnography and design or human factors in design um, having that kind of collaboration. In other cases, there's a restructuring of fields and parts begin to change. And so methods get borrowed and things start to morph, you know, service design, who, who knows what that is in terms of traditional kinds of design practice. It involves business, it involves, you know, issues related to anthropology and, and sociology, it involves psychology, it involves traditional kinds of design fields. And then there are those concerns that are kind of overarching. And I would say design thinking is a good example of one of those where different disciplines share an interest in the same area. And I think we have to start thinking about what we do pedagogically to accommodate those. All three of those kinds of things are happening in design at the moment. And so how do we, how do we accommodate that in the kind of work that we're doing and also recognize what that work, especially at the doctoral level, is doing to change the nature of the field. So, um, so yes, I think there are a lot of a lot of challenges that are going to come from from our current condition, but we're going to learn something about this as well. I think we're going to learn that we have a much more connected um, set of issues than we perhaps thought we did when we were operating in independently. 